Uh, I want to ap apologize for the delay. We've had uh, enormous queue at the gates. And so we decided to wait uh, the 15 minutes so that we could get everybody in. And there might be, there's still a bit of a queue there. And so there might be some disturbances when people try and come in. And we'll try and get that, uh, do that as, as quietly and as quickly as we can. Uh, I do want to say certain important thank yous. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Mr. Roger Price and Mr. Michael Price, and the guest speaker, of course, Mr. Vinsel. Uh, also, the SIA, South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, President Paul von, uh, Paul von Nikar. Welcome to all of you uh, to Vince University. This lecture is really named after Dr. Bernard Price both because of his great contribution as an engineer to the power supply industry in South Africa and as a president <coughs> of this institute. He was also a founder, a great friend of Wits University, and a founder of the Bennett Price Institutes of <coughs> Geophysical Research and of Paleontology at this University of Advertisement. A great friend, as I've said. Now, it is particularly useful to think, it's particularly notable that, the, that this particular lecture is on reimagining the internet in the 21st century. Because Bullet Prices really should be noted for two fundamental elements in his life. The first is his passion for science. Science defined him. It, uh, it is what he made his career out of. It is what he was such a great friend of this university for. And his particularly versatile approach to science. He wasn't tied to a particular discipline. He had a versatility to science that was particularly incredible. But the second thing that he needs to be noted for was his role in development. And often that's not understood. We think that development is really contributed to by social scientists in our society. But somebody like Dr. Bernard Price had an enormous role, particularly because of his <coughs> contribution as an engineer to the power supply industry. And if anybody, anybody knows anything about development in South African society, it's the centrality of power to that, to that, to that, to that, to that enterprise. And, <coughs> and what is particularly striking is that this lecture also speaks to those two thematic issues. I mean, the internet is about science. It is about science pioneering the internet. It's about the innovations associated with science that led to its creation. But it's also about how it transformed science over the last 30, 40 years. And it seems to me that the internet is not only both an innovator of science and a product of science and a transformation of science. But it's also going to be playing a fundamental role in the developmental agenda of the 21st century. If anything has the capacity to bridge the scourge of the last three or four centuries, which is the, the divide between the imperial and colonial worlds, it's going to be the capacity of the internet. Because what the internet does is it breaks down boundaries. And it brings down national and all kinds of other boundaries in ways that could fundamentally transform our world. And so this particular thematic lecture on the internet speaks to both elements of, the, of, the, of Dr. Bernard Price's life, the element of science and the element of development. And it's particularly instructive that it's going to be Vince who's going to be speaking on this because he's really, in a lot of ways, the father of the internet. He is the best expression of science, but I just think <laughs> Sorry about that. That's the calendar program going on. One of the great, the great expressions, the great symbols of, of, science, of science in the 20th and 21st century. But also, what he is, is the father of effectively the one agency that's going to transform development in the 21st century. 
And so I don't think we could have found a more fitting, eminent person than Vince Cerf to give and to provide the 67th Bernard Price Memorial Lecture. So really, welcome to Vince. On behalf of the Chancellor of the University of Advertisement and the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, the Council of this university extends to members, friends, and all good seats in this room, and I see many of you here, a hearty welcome to attend this important annual event, to listen to our very eminent uh, professor, and by being present, to pay tribute to engineers, past and present, who have so greatly contributed to the cause of technical excellence, development, and science in our country, our continent, and our world. Welcome to the 62nd <laughs> Bernard Price Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Fenneke. I have the, uh, the honor of being the 2013 president of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. Uh, and having listened to, to uh, uh, Adam's introduction of uh, the Price Memorial, I wasn't going to say much about that, except that one thing he left out was that Bernard Price, besides all the contributions he made to the, to the university, was also the president of the Institute of Electrical Engineers at, uh, at, at one stage. And I think uh, the contributions he made in South Africa were tremendous, and also his contributions to geophysical research at, at Protestant University. Uh, one thing I want to point out, these, uh, the, the, the Twitterati and all the technology over here pointed out to me, that I must tell you that that hashtag BPML over there means hashtag Bernard Price Memorial Lecture 2013. I don't quite know what that means, but I think it means you can send a Twitter into this thing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it somehow. <laughs> anyway, in terms of this great tradition of uh, uh, Dr. Bernard Price's contributions to, to electrical yeah, engineering. Yeah, I noticed. That's good. In terms of this great tradition, this year's lecture is going to be presented by Dr. Vincent Cerf. Vinton G. Cerf, let's get that right. Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist of Google. Vint has served in this position at Google since October 2005. In this role, he is responsible for identifying new and enabling technologies and to support the development of advanced internet-based products and services from Google. As for the active, he's also the active face of Google in the internet world, and he's widely known as one of the fathers of the internet. And I mentioned that earlier, and in our advertising, some people made some rude comments about how many fathers there are of the internet. But I think that's the one that we have, which is, which is right. He's also the co-designer of, of TCP and IP protocols and the architecture of the internet. Uh, uh, Vinton is also a recipient of numerous awards and commendations and connections with his work on the internet. Uh, I, I read through this thing, and it was going to take another lecture for me to read them all, so I've decided to uh, abbreviate it slightly, so I'm going to name the, some of the major awards that Vinton has received. Uh, in December 1997, President Clinton presented the U.S. National Medal of Technology to Surf and his colleague Robert Kahn for founding and developing the Internet. In 2004, Kahn and Surf were named the recipients of the ACM Allen M. Turing Award for their work on the Internet protocols. Incidentally, this M. Turing Award is also known in the scientific world as a Nobel Prize uh, of uh, science. Uh, so, in November 2005, President George Bush, Bush presented Surf and Khan the Presidential Medal of Freedom for their work. This medal is the highest civilian award that's ever been given in the United States to its citizens. In April 2008, Surf and Khan received the prestigious J Japan Prize, and in 2013, Surf and Khan and three others received the Queen Elizabeth Prize in Engineering. This, this goes on for a long time, so I wasn't going to read them all, so I read the major ones, and then we can talk about the rest. In addition, Surf was appointed by President Obama to serve on the National Science Board beginning in February 2013. He's president of the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM. Surf also served as the founding president of the Internet Society from 1992 to 1995, and in 1999 served as a 
Chairman of the Board. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to present to you uh, Dr. Vinton Surf to present his, his paper to you. If I can ask him to come up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, introduction, and you can see now what happens when your computer is running other programs besides the one you intended to show. Um, let's see if I can get my slides back. Uh, I always get nervous when people clap before you've said anything. <laughs> I feel like you should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Um, I am really delighted to be back here in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, it is not the first time uh, I've been here. I came in 1974 for the first time. And uh, I had two gentlemen with me, Chris Kearns and uh, Gerd van der Veer, who are in the front row. They were responsible for helping me and others demonstrate the ARPANET to a community of people who were involved with or interested in what was called IFIP Technical Committee 6, which focused on communications. I did not know until last night's reunion, uh, and uh, although, Gerd, I don't think there's time to repeat the wonderful story you told, I'm going to compress it a little bit, because in an earlier meeting today, he gave this absolutely wonderful description of a consequence of the demonstration of that technology 40 years ago. It turns out that uh, up until that time, sharing of telecommunication circuits was an absolute no-no. You know, if you needed a telecom circuit, you got a dedicated circuit from the, uh, the telco, and that was it. You couldn't share it with anybody else. Packet switching is all about sharing common circuits. And so this would have been a non-starter had it not been for the fact that Gerd brought two of the most senior people responsible for that policy to see a private demonstration of the ARPANET. And after we showed them how this thing worked and the things that you could do with it, Gerd tells me that there was a change in the policy which would permit sharing, which allows this kind of technology to exist in this country. And so I had no idea uh, what an important role that demonstration played, but I do think, looking back on it, that there were people in this country who saw 40 years into the future as a result of that demonstration in 1974. Well, what I would like to do is take you back into time even before 1974, to uh, show you uh, the very beginnings of the Internet based on a program and a project that was funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency called ARPANET. Uh, the problem that we were trying to solve at the time was an economic problem. ARPA was sponsoring computer science departments around the United States, about a dozen of them, to do research in artificial intelligence, image understanding, speech understanding, logical reasoning, and the like. And we also believe that involving computers in non-computational uh, comp ways, dealing with um, you know, communications, dealing with uh, information exchange and understanding, as opposed to simply raw number crunching, was very important. And we were thinking in terms of command and control. But the specific reason for building this network was economic. Because ARPA was sponsoring all this research, every single university that was funded kept saying every year that ARPA needed to buy them the latest world-class computers so they could continue to do world-class research. And even ARPA couldn't afford to do that for 12 universities. So they said, ARPA, we are building a network and you're going to have to share. And they hated that idea. They each wanted to have their own machines, and we said, nope, can't talk us out of it. We're building a network, and you can share, so some people will get the latest equipment, some people will have equipment from a year or two back. So we started in 1968. There was a competition, a company called Bolt, Baronek, and Newman won the competition and built an ARPA, ARPANET packet switch, which was called an IMP, an interface message processor. The first four nodes were installed in the last four months of 1969. I was a graduate student at UCLA at the time, working in Len Kleinrock's laboratory for network management and measurement. My job was to write the software to connect the Sigma 7 computer to the ARPA IMP. The Sigma 7's in a museum somewhere today, and some people think I should be there along with it, but here I am. 
<clears throat> so this is our first four node system. This is what the packet switch looked like. It was the size of a refrigerator. It was based on a Honeywell DDP 516 computer, which isn't made anymore. Uh, and it was delivered to UCLA in a very heavy duty metal cabinet. And the reason it was delivered in that form is that BBNN knew that it, they were delivering it to a military organization and they all knew that it was going into an extremely hostile environment, a place filled with graduate students and undergraduate students. And so, you know, we needed to make sure that this was well protected. In addition to demonstrating packet switching using dedicated telephone circuits and those imps that acted as packet switches, Bob Kahn, who was one of the chief architects of the uh, ARPANET at Bolt Baronek and Newman, left the company and joined ARPA to begin a whole series of networking research programs, one of which was called Packet Radio. Now, you need to appreciate this is in the mid-1970s that this is all happening. The idea was that if you were going to use computers in command and control, if you were really serious about that, not only did you need to have fixed installations network, but you had to have mobile vehicles be part of the system, airborne vehicles and ships at sea. Now for ground mobile, we needed things that would move around on the ground and be radio connected. You can't use wires, right? Because the tanks run over the wires and they break. So it doesn't work. So we needed radio for that. And in the case of ships at sea, you needed satellite capability to uh, connect over long distances. But we wanted to use packet switching as a way of sharing the radio bandwidth. This particular packet radio van was built by SRI International <clears throat> in the San Francisco Bay Area in order to demonstrate, test and demonstrate mobile packet radio. Now some of you, uh, if you have a communications background, will recognize that spread spectrum communication was pretty special in the 19, early 1970s. This system used a spread spectrum communications radio running in the 1710 to 1850 band, uh, and it used code division multiple access <coughs> in order with you know, a, the direct sequence spreading in order to share the radio channel with multiple transmitters, distinguishing the transmissions they were interested in by knowing which uh, chipping code uh, was the thing they were listening for. So we had this um, uh, fixed installations on the mountaintops on top of the San Francisco Bay Area plus the mobile vehicles that were driving around. This turned out to be <clears throat> a really interesting piece of technology. The radios were running at 100 to 400 kilobits a second using the Spets rectum signal uh, and they took about a cubic foot. These are the white things that you see there. So there were four of them. A cubic foot of radio equipment costing $50,000 each. You are holding those things in your pocket right now. And they were a lot, they are a lot less expensive than that. But back then, in the 74, 75 frame, that's what they looked like. I don't know, I think I have a slide here. Yes. Now, we were not just interested in data communications because when you're doing command and control, you need voice, data, video, and all kinds of other things. So we were experimenting with packetized voice in the mid 1970s. Now, imagine for just a moment what a standard voice signal looks like when it's digitized. It's 64 kilobits a second. 8 bits per sample, 8,000 samples per second. We had a backbone speed in the ARPANET, the fixed line network, of 50 kilobits a second. You can't put too much 64 kilobit voice through a 50 kilobit channel. Uh, and the satellite uh, system, which is a multiple ground station shared system, was also running at only 64 kilobits. So <clears throat> we decided that we clearly are going to have to compress the uh, data rate requirement for voice. So we decided to use a technique called linear predictive code with 10 parameters. What this does is, is take the speech sound in, digitize it, and then analyze that speech sound as if it were coming from a stack of cylinders, 10 of them, whose diameter is changing as a function of your speech and excited by a formant frequency. So we would transmit to the other side just the 10 parameters, the, the 10 diameters of the uh, cylinders plus the formant frequency. So that got the data rate down to 1800 bits a second. Now there was a side effect of that because the quality of voice does degrade when you go from 64 kilobits to 1800 bits a second. The side effect of talking through the system uh, essentially made everyone who spoke through it sound like a drunken Norwegian. <laughs> but it was all understandable. So the day came when I'm, in the, I'm now at, at ARPA myself, and I'm running the program, the interneting program, the packet radio, packet satellite, and so on. 
and I have to demonstrate this system to a bunch of generals at the Pentagon. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to do this? And then I realized that one of the participants in the packetized voice program was from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. <laughs> so we got Ingvar to be the speaker. We had him speak through the ordinary Autobahn switch voice system. Then we had him talk through our packet radio system, packet voice system, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> We didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound that way. But not only were we doing experiments with packetized voice, but we were doing experiments with packetized video as well. And again, compression, not a whole lot of capacity to do that. But over time, I mean, Bob and I were, Bob Kahn and I were absolutely convinced that over time, more and more capacity would become available. Optical fiber wasn't really readily available till the early 1980s. And of course, its capacity has expanded dramatically, <coughs> dramatically over time with dense wavelength, uh, wavelength division multiplexing, among other things. This is the part where I'm supposed to talk while I'm drinking the water and make it, make it sound like my laptop is the dummy, right? OK. So the thing I want to emphasize is that we were contemplating applications which you use today every day 30 years, 40 years in the future. By 1977, we had gone through four iterations of the design of the protocols of the Internet. We started out with a protocol called TCP for Transmission Control uh, Protocol, and it was designed to keep the packets in order, or put them back in order if they'd gotten out of order, retransmit packets that had gotten lost, do error correction and, and detection. Um, and the whole idea behind this was to uh, recover from losses from packets passing through multiple networks. Our purpose was to allow a network to build itself uh, or to grow uh, without much limit and to essentially organically uh, become a larger and larger collection of networks. <clears throat> but this is the first demonstration with three different networks that we had built, packet radio, the packet satellite, and the ARPANET. By this time, the ARPANET had expanded across the United States with military and research uh, university installations on it, plus some installations in Europe, in Norway, Sweden, and in uh, um, uh, London, uh, in the UK, <clears throat> with using an internal satellite link. The packet satellite system was using uh, Intelsat 4A. It had multiple ground stations that were sharing a common 64 kilobit channel using the kind of Ethernet in the sky tactic. So you would, you would transmit Ethernet style, which means whenever you want to, a requirement for access to the capacity, and everybody would be listening. The multiple ground stations would listen to these demands for capacity during this Ethernet-like uh, period of time. And then, assuming everybody heard the requests, you know, forgetting the possibility of, of collisions, if everybody heard the requests, then they all calculated the same schedule. So that then you went into a scheduled mode, and the people who had requested capacity would get the capacity in the order that they requested it, because everybody had the same algorithm. So we had packet satellite, packet radio, and uh, internet, all, or ARPANET, all running at the same time using the TCP IP protocols. So I want you to imagine, we have the Bayshore uh, packet radio van going up and down. It's radiating packets going through a gateway to the ARPANET, going all the way across the ARPANET into uh, U the UK, uh, to the University College London, out of the ARPANET to another gateway into the packet satellite network, then back down to a ground station in ETAM, West Virginia, back into the ARPANET through another gateway, all the way across the ARPANET to USC Information Sciences Institute in Los Angeles. Now, the distance between the packet radio van and the San Francisco area in Los Angeles is 400 miles. The distance that the packets traveled was 100,000 miles because they went through two satellite hops back and forth across the Atlantic in the United States. And it worked. And I remember leaping up and down saying, it works, it works, you know, as if it couldn't possibly work. I mean, this is software. It's a miracle when software works. So this was one of the most important demonstrations because you can almost always make two networks talk to each other by doing something funny in between. But getting three different networks to work with different speeds, different error rates, different packet sizes, and everything else using a standard format, standard protocol, was a really important demo. So this is a big milestone for us. Here's what the Internet looks like now. It's 400,000 or 500,000 networks, we call them autonomous systems, all interconnected with each other 
anybody in emitting a packet from any one of those networks can find its way to a destination on the internet. This is not a top-down design. This is not a centrally managed system. This is a gigantic global collaboration. And when Bob and I released the design of the internet in 1973, we thought, we want to remove all barriers to peoples implementing this stuff. We had no patents. We didn't even have copyrights, because this was a government. US government is not allowed to copyright anything. We simply released this to the general public. And as Gerd mentioned this afternoon, our first presentation of the design of the system was at the University of Sussex in the UK in September of 1973. Now, the fact that we were able to do this in the middle of the Cold War with a, a Defense Department-sponsored research project does uh, raise some questions. And how could we have possibly have done that? And the answer is we just did it, and nobody noticed. And we didn't ask permission. But our theory was that we wanted no barriers to implementation. We didn't want anyone to feel like they had to pay a licensing fee or anything else. Now, there was a reason for our doing this. Our reasoning was that uh, up until that time, most of the networking that was going on was proprietary. You got, if you got a bunch of machines from IBM, you could hook them together using uh, SNA. If you got computers from Digital Equipment Corporation, you could hook them together using DECnet. But they didn't talk to each other because these were proprietary protocols. We didn't want the Defense Department to be trapped in the corner having to buy computers from only one maker in order to network them. We wanted a non-proprietary protocol, so that's why we released it. The other reason we did it globally is that we didn't know who our allies would be in the future, and we knew that that might change. And uh, so we wanted to make sure that nobody had a reason not to build this stuff for compatibility. Now, one of the interesting features of the internet layer protocol is that it was non-national in scope. The telephone system has national identities in it. It has uh, national country codes. And then from there, you have uh, allocation of phone numbers. We rejected that design and said that all we wanted the addressing to do is to recognize the topology of the system so that it didn't matter where the network was. It only mattered what it was connected to. And so we assigned numbers to each autonomous network. And we used that information to figure out how to route traffic through the system. And there was even a rationale for that. Here's the scenario that went through my head. Uh, I thought, well, let's see. If we use these national code idea, what would happen if country A was going to invade country B in two weeks, and it needed address space from country B in order to run its command and control system after they got there? So you can imagine saying, uh, excuse me, uh, we're planning to invade uh, you in two weeks' time. Can we get some address space? so we can run our command and control system while we're in the middle of invading your country. And I didn't think that was going to work very well. So we said, let's have a non-national addressing structure. And that's exactly what we did, and that is what we have done. All right, let's keep going. Here are some of the statistics which are approximately correct. The uh, slightly under 1 billion machines on the network that have dedicated IP addresses and have dedicated domain names. This does not count the episodically connected machines like laptops, desktops, tablets, and mobiles, which are on and off the net from time to time. As you start looking at those numbers, you're talking 3 billion machines or more. The number of users on the net is unknown because you don't have one central place where you have to dedicate you know, to sign up or anything. Uh, I'm extrapolating from information that came from a year ago. I am guessing on the order of 3 billion people are now online one way or the other. Many of them are online using smartphones from the mobile network, which, by the way, has been a really interesting development over the last decade or two. I want to emphasize for you why this has turned out to be so important. The mobile itself is a very powerful machine. It does make phone calls, but it does a whole bunch of other things. And by standardizing application programming interfaces, you enable literally hundreds of thousands of people to write applications that will run on those machines. The thing is that most of those applications are not strictly local. What they do is activate things in the internet. And so this mobile platform is, in, is enhancing the value of access to the net because it gives it access to you wherever you are, assuming you have access to the base station. But it, the other side of the, of the coin is that the utility of that mobile is a function of the computing power and applications and content of the internet. And so these two systems, the internet and the mobile system, are mutually reinforcing. The two technologies come together in a hypergolic way. They provide added value in both dimensions. 
So this has been an important development. And for the folks who have been involved in doing uh, mobile networking and mobile phones and everything else, uh, <clears throat> I have great respect and appreciation. There are about 7 billion mobiles in the world today. Some fraction of them are smartphones. Maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, or even 25%. But over time, of course, it will reach 100% because it will be too expensive to build a machine that isn't a smartphone. You know, the chipsets are just going to be there, and you just build them, and there you go. Uh, of course, Google is quite interested in that, and that's why we released our Android operating system uh, on a, a free basis to everybody. Now, there are a bunch of things happening to the Internet, and the purpose of, for this slide is to reinforce for you the idea that in spite of the fact that the design was done 40 years ago and the it was turned on 30 years ago, this thing is still evolving. This is not a fixed architecture that can't be changed. And in fact, there are people, some of them in this room, who are already exploring new ways of adapting this network to new applications and practices. Now, one of the um, mildly embarrassing things about the design is that in 1973, when Bob and I were doing the original design, <coughs> we wondered, how many terminations should we have in this internet? And uh, now, first of all, we didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, and second, it was an experiment. So I remember the conversation well. We said, um, we just did the ARPANET, right? Yes. And he said, that was fairly expensive, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, how many networks do you think there'll be per country? And we thought, well, maybe two. You know, so there would be, you know, kind of competition. Uh, now, on, on a national scale, you know, that's not a totally crazy. Uh, and then we said, how many countries are there? And there wasn't any Google to ask, so. <laughs> so, so we guessed at 128, because that was a power of two. And, uh, the, you know, programmers think in powers of two. So that was 256 nets. OK, we need 8 bits for that. Okay, how many computers are there going to be on the network? Well, at the time, 1973, the computers that were on the net were big time-sharing machines that served anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 people. And we thought, well, you know, how many of those could there be? And then we thought, well, there were many computers. And you know, we were kind of anticipating workstations. We hadn't quite anticipated uh, you know, laptops and things like that. But Xerox Park, which was a mile and a half from my lab at Stanford, had done the Alto workstation in the 1970s. We knew about that. We knew about Ethernet. So we had this inkling of proliferation of networks. So we guessed 16 million machines per network. That's 24 bits, right? So that gave us 8 plus 24 is 32-bit address space for 4.3 billion terminations, which I thought ought to be enough to do an experiment. Now, what I thought. What I thought at the time was that we would do the experiment of the internet, and we would demonstrate that it worked, we hope. And then, if it did work, we would do a production version. The problem is the experiment escaped out of the laboratory, got into the you know, public uh, domain, and people started building pieces of it. Now, part of our strategy in the design and the way in which we released this was exactly to try to get people to build pieces of internet and find someone to connect to. We hoped that it would grow in a very organic way. We didn't have a limit on the number of networks except for our original broken estimate of 256 nets. Uh, in the middle of all this, we had to reinterpret what those 32 bits meant. And so we had class A, B, C, and D, depending on how big the network was. And now we have classless uh, mechanisms with variable length uh, addressing uh, within the 32-bit space, distinguishing the network from uh, the host on the other side. Uh, and, and this actually worked for uh, quite a long time until February of 2011. The organization that hands out internet address space blocks is called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. There is an organization inside of that called the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and they hand out address space to the regional internet registries, of which there are five. One of them is here in Africa called AFRINIC. They ran out in February of 2011. Fortunately, the engineers who are active in the Internet Engineering Task Force, which makes standards for Internet, were actually scared to death in the 1990s that we were going to run out of address space. And so they quickly developed I another version of the Internet packet format called IP version 6. It has 128 uh, bits in the address field. That's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. I used to go around saying, this means every electron in the universe can have its own web page if it wants to. 
until I got an email from somebody at Caltech saying, Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there are 10 to the 88 electrons in the universe and you're off by 50 orders of magnitude. <laughs> so I don't say that anymore. We turned on the IPv6 format formally last year on June 6, 2012. Google is operating in parallel v4 and v6. Many other companies are. The number of ISPs are, but not enough of them. Too many of them are saying, oh, I haven't run out of v4 address space yet, so I don't need to implement IPv6. Wrong. Where people have run out of IPv4 address space and where they have to use IPv6, which for example, is going to be the case if it isn't already for mobile set-top boxes, automobiles, anything which has large-scale proliferation, you must have v6 capabilities so that your customer can reach things that are running IPv6 somewhere else in the world where there isn't any more v4 space available. So you just have to do that. It's logic. But these idiots are saying, nobody's asking for it. No normal human being should know anything about IPv4 or IPv6. You shouldn't have to ask for that. The job of an ISP is to make sure you don't have to ask for that and make sure you have address space whenever you need it. So please do me a favor, call your ISP and ask them, what is your plan for IPv6 implementation and when will I get my address space? Please do that. I would appreciate that. Now, in addition to that little uh, deal, <clears throat> uh, for many, many years, uh, the domain names of the internet were written in ASCII characters, the letters A through Z, the digits 0 through 9, and hyphen. But there are a bunch of languages, 11 of which you can find here, uh, at least some of the 11, which are not necessarily expressible uh, in um, uh, ASCII characters. And so you know, we have to deal with things like Cyrillic, Korean, Chinese, and Arabic, and uh, Hebrew, and so on. And so we implemented a design of the domain name system that allowed all of the uh, characters of Unicode to be used to uh, express domain names. And so this is called internationalized domain names. and ICANN is in the process of implementing that. In addition to that, the top-level domain space, things like .com, .net, and .org, and the country codes like .za, are all part of a, an expanding space of generic top-level domains. So ICANN has just opened up the domain name space to new generic top-level domains, and they got 2,000 applications at $185,000 per application. $350 million flowed into ICANN over the course of a week or so. Uh, they're in the middle now of going through all these things. There are some conflicts because some people ask, you know, bid, uh, propose the same domain name, so they have to resolve all that. Some of them uh, are in dispute, uh, and some of them uh, are, uh, have now gotten through several phases of approval. So there are about 1,700 top-level domains that are on their way into the uh, operational system and another 300 that still have to be uh, resolved. <clears throat> but the, the face of the Internet is changing now in terms of what it looks like and how many top-level domains there are. Now, security is still a big issue in the net. And here I have a very, I've been conflicted for a long time. Uh, in 1975, uh, when I was at Stanford, uh, remember this was a Defense Department-sponsored uh, research program. I started working with the National Security Agency on the design of a secure Internet. And uh, the problem is that the only cryptography that was available in that time, in the 75 period, was classified cryptography. And I could not tell my colleagues who didn't have clearances how a secured system would work. And so for years I was schizophrenic about this because the Internet laboratory experiment that escaped into the public world was not the one that was being designed for uh, classified uh, use. Uh, at this stage of the game, however, in 2013, cryptographic capability exists in the public domain, or at least in, uh, available under licensing, like uh, elliptic code encryption and things of that sort. Public key cryptography, ironically, was first announced in 1977, literally at the point where I was standardizing the Internet protocols. The paper was written by two of my uh, Stanford colleagues, Marty Hellman and Whit Diffie, and they didn't show an example. They just described the feasibility or possibility that, that programs existed that could do public key crypto. And so I didn't have anything of substance to apply at the time, and they needed to standardize the system to get it, the experiments going. So the irony of it all is that if I had maybe waited a little bit of time, we would have had public key crypto in the system as well. Now we are applying some of these uh, public key developments into the core of the Internet. So the domain name system, for example, now has something called domain name system security extensions 
so that the uh, entries in the domain name zone files can have a digitally signed combination of domain name and IP address. And those two are digitally signed so that when you ask for what's the IP address of this domain name, what you get back is an answer in digitally signed so you know that it has integrity, it hasn't been changed. And that's important to avoid certain kinds of spoofing. Similarly, there are some issues about people hijacking address space at the IP layer, and that's being addressed with something called RPKI. The last three bullets here are just to remind you that the Internet is not just about termination points that are generating and receiving uh, information that human beings are absorbing, but now we're seeing sensor networks being part of the network. Uh, we're seeing a smart grid program in the U.S. which is creating electricity-consuming devices that keep track of how and when they use power and are willing to accept advice like, please don't use power for the next 15 minutes because we're reaching a peak load, and if you keep doing that, we'll have a blackout. And so we get smart devices that are helping us understand what do we do to generate the bill at the end of the month, which devices do we use and when and how much, and we're also getting devices that are trying to suppress usage if necessary in order to avoid power blackouts. And that is part of the smart grid program and mobiles, of course, we've already talked about. So there are some challenges here, and I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with them. Getting infrastructure built has been a non-trivial exercise. I learned something in the course of the last day or so about all the permits that are needed in order to bring in fiber, and including things like water rights permits because you're putting something across a bridge. Uh, there are a lot of bureaucratic steps that are required in order to build infrastructure in the country. It feels to me like there's some real utility in creating fast track uh, procedures for allowing new infrastructure to be built. So the regulatory models which don't allow sharing of radio capacity, now we've got sharing of dedicated lines but we don't have sharing of radio capacity. We have the same problem in the US where the regulators try to auction off capacity in the, in the spectrum and get a big chunk of money and they think that's wonderful. I have a different view. I think we should use technology to allow sharing of radio spectrum we can use all kinds of digital methods to let simultaneous transmissions be separated uh, and correctly disarticulated by the receivers instead of using the 1916 style radios that you know just pick up everything and get in, in, are unable to distinguish two simultaneous translation, uh, transmissions. So I'd like to see a very different view where shared spectrum is the norm and instead of trying to sell the spectrum to one monopoly party give it away like, like we did with Wi-Fi, and then generate revenue from the taxes that you produce from all the business that is produced out of the sharing of the spectrum. You get much more efficient use of the spectrum, more people are using it, more businesses are operating, and a bigger opportunity for revenue generation in my view. Now, I'm, I'm, I won't have time to go through all of these things, but I want you to read those words and recognize that these are all important challenges here in this country and in elsewhere in the world. There are a lot of people who don't understand what utility the Internet could bring to them. There are businesses that don't understand what it means to be present in the Internet environment. They don't necessarily understand that because Internet penetration here is only about 20 percent, worldwide it's 40 percent on average, in some countries it's 92 percent. So you sit here thinking we're going to have to wait a long time before we have a lot of penetration so we can use Internet internally so we can use internet domestically to build up GDP. That's not true. Your companies, new ones especially, emerging uh, companies, could use the internet to service places that are already heavily penetrated. Think globally. Think about a global market. Think about providing products and services not only domestically but also uh, externally. And then start imagining what kinds of possibilities there are for creating success successful and sustainable businesses that are serving a much bigger market than the purely domestic one. And while you're doing that, let's build up the domestic capability. Let's build up the infrastructure to let everybody in this country take advantage of the use and access to the Internet. So there's a lot of mobile uh, implementation here, which is a great thing. Lots of people will have their first uh, experience accessing Internet services through a mobile before they get laptops, desktops, or pads, or other kinds of things. Okay, so now let me go to the Internet of Things. Um, this is a phrase that's common in Europe, uh, and the idea here is that there are appliances that normally are not part of the Internet that are becoming part of the Internet because they have computing capability on board. Sometimes it was used to manage the performance of a device like a microwave oven, 
and th that same computing power could be used to put the device on the net. So um, there are internet-enabled refrigerators, they're kind of high-end things right now, but they have nice touch-sensitive displays. And I don't know about you, but in American families, our family communication is done with paper and magnets. You know, we stick paper up on the on the uh, board on the uh, front of the refrigerator to write notes to each other. So now, with the touch-sensitive, high-resolution display, we can have blogs and websites, and you know, a much richer kind of communication among the family members. But the more interesting question is, what else could you do with an internet-enabled refrigerator? And I've often thought, well, what if you had an RFID chip on everything that goes inside the refrigerator? So it knows what it has inside. So while you're off at work or at school, it's surfing the internet looking for recipes that it could make with what it has inside. <laughs> so when you come home, you find lists of things to have for dinner. This is, so you can extrapolate this. You can imagine being on holiday, and uh, you get an email. It's from your refrigerator. And, and it says, uh, you put the milk in the refrigerator three weeks ago, and it's going to crawl out on its own now. Because of, or maybe you're shopping, and you get an SMS from the refrigerator. Don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else we need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, unfortunately, the Japanese have really spoiled this idyllic picture. They've built an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And, you know, when you step on the scale, it figures out which family member you are based on your weight. It sends that information to the doctor. It becomes part of your medical record. Perfectly okay. No problem. But the refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> So you come home and you see diet recipes on the display. <laughs> now, what about picture frames that become part of the internet environment? And I remember somebody running into my office in the mid-1990s saying, Ben, eh, Ben, did you see the internet-enabled picture frame? And I thought, that sounds about as useful as an electric fork. You know, huh? <laughs> so I was wrong. Uh, everybody has a digital camera now. And so, like many families, uh, we have picture frames. Uh, around the house, and uh, they will automatically download images that we have uploaded around, among the family to these websites. And so you can, you know, the grandparents can sort of look uh, to see what's going on with the family by watching the photographs going uh, across these uh, internet enabled picture frames. Of course, there's a security issue here because if somebody uh, breaks into the uh, web server that uh, the pictures are being served from, the grandparents may see pictures of what they hope is not the grandchildren. So security is just as important at home as it is at work. Now, uh, we all know about mobiles. There's an Android uh, phone for you. The guy in the middle is the one that really amazes me. Uh, he's invented an internet-enabled surfboard. And I haven't met him, uh, but I have this image in my head that uh, he's been out on the water waiting for the next wave, thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. <laughs> So we put a laptop in the surfboard, we put a Wi-Fi service back at the rescue shack, and now he sells this as a product. So if you want to be out on the, on the water surfing and you want to surf the internet at the same time, that's what you need. Now for years, I used to tell jokes about, someday every light bulb in the world will have its own internet address. Ha ha. I can't tell that joke anymore because somebody sent me an internet-enabled IPv6 radio LED light bulb and it, it costs about $20, which is a lot of money for a light bulb, but it lasts about 15 years because it's an LED system. And so this means that I can plug that in and become part of the internet environment in the house. I can turn it on, turn it off, find out what state it's in, find out if it's broken. It all becomes part of this networked environment, which is increasingly surrounding all of us. And finally, there's Google Glass. That's Sergey Brin uh, modeling the Google Glass. Now, I know there's been a lot of controversy about Google Glass. People worry about when is the camera on and when is it taking pictures and all this stuff. We will get, you know, we'll solve that problem. Right now, this is experimental. I imagine at some point when it becomes a commercial product next year, there'll be something that shows that the camera is on and things like that. Look, it can't run continuously. It only has 16 gigabytes of memory, so you can only absorb a certain amount of video that way anyhow or, or uh, imagery. That's not what's important about this experiment. What's important about this experiment is that we are putting a computer into your uh, sensory environment. It sees what you see and it hears what you hear. Let me give you an example of what that might mean. Suppose that we have a blind German speaker and we have a deaf American Sign Language speaker and they're both wearing Google Glass. 
So let's see what happens. The German guy starts speaking in German. Of course, the deaf guy doesn't hear this, but the Google Glass microphone hears it. Detects the speech, translates it into text, translates the German text into English and displays the English in the display of the Google Glass so the deaf guy can read what was said. Now the deaf guy responds in American Sign Language. The blind guy can't see that, but the Google Glass video camera does. And it translates the sign language gestures into English, translates the English into German, and plays the German as speech through the bone conduction part of the Google Glass so the blind guy can hear the German. We can do almost all of that today. The one thing we cannot do very well is the ASL, recognizing the, somebody who is signing. But there is an intermediate step that I have seen already. It's a glove that you can wear in which the positioning of the fingers is very well articulated to the computer so we can actually see what's going on. You can, you can actually interpret ASL that way. Someday we may get to the point where the Google Glass video is good enough that we can do the interpretation that way. But even without that, we're awfully close. So that's the kind of thing that's important. It's getting computers to be our partners in a common sensory environment, interacting with us the way other humans do. And I believe that this is just an example of doing that. It's convenient because it just sits on your head like a pair of glasses. It leaves your hands completely free. You talk to it. You ask it to do things. You tell it to do things. It tells you what it's discovered. It shows you what it's discovered. It shows you maps. It shows you routes. It shows you your email. It lets you respond to your email by talking. Uh, it lets you do Google searches by speaking what it is you want to look for. And those are just the standard applications that Google has already implemented. We have a couple of thousand explorers out there trying out new applications in the Google Glass environment. So by the time these become commercial products, we hope to have quite a long list of applications that they're capable of doing. Now, I have to tell you, everyone over the age of 50 says to me, can you make it recognize the people that I'm seeing? Because I can never remember their names. <laughs> and, you know, there's some issues about that called privacy, right? Because some people don't want to be recognized. And so we, have, we are not implementing any of that right now. But I will confess to you at my advanced age that I would find that a very useful application. All right, so here's another example of a sensor network in my house. This is not me in the garage with a soldering gun. This is a commercial product from a company called ArchRock that was acquired by Cisco Systems a few years ago. These devices run on two AA batteries. They're about the size of a mobile. And they detect the temperature, humidity, and light levels in the house. And every five minutes, they send that information to a server down in my basement. Now, the way they do this is to build a mesh network automatically. So these are store and forward devices in addition to being uh, sensors. Uh, these gadgets will report all that information. Now, at the end of the year, I have high quality engineering data about the heating and ventilation and air conditioning in the house. How well did it work? Now, I know only a geek would do that, but it turns out that this is really useful for understanding how to configure your HVAC. Now, you can imagine doing this in office buildings. Uh, you can certainly imagine doing it in residences, but in an office building, it might make a really big difference to have that kind of data available. So uh, I have one room in the house that's particularly important. It's the wine cellar. And it has a couple of thousand bottles in it, and I need to keep it below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has a lot of, not enough, but it has a lot of South African wine in it, so this is important to me. Uh, so I've alarmed that one. So if the temperature goes above 60 degrees, I get an SMS on my mobile. This actually has happened a couple of times when the cooling system has failed and nobody's been at home. I get an SMS saying, your wine is warming up. And one time I was away for several days. Every five minutes for two days, I kept getting a message saying, your wine is getting warmer. So I called up, fortunately, it didn't get above 70 degrees, so it was OK. But I called uh, ArchRock, and I said, do you make remote actuators? They said, yes. OK, so this is a weekend project. We install the remote actuator. Then I said, um, do you have strong authentication on this system? And they said, yes. And said, good, because there's a 15-year-old next door, and I don't want him messing around with my cooling system. Then I got to thinking, you know, I could probably could tell if somebody's gone into the wine cellar when I'm not there, because I could see if the light was turned off and on but I don't know what they did in there. So um, my next project 
is to put RFID chips on the wine bottles and do instantaneous inventories in order to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. And I was proudly describing this design to one of my engineering friends, and he said, there's a bug. What do you mean there's a bug? And he says, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. <laughs> so now I have to put sensors in the cork. And as long as I'm going to do that, I might as well sample the esters to figure out, you know, that's the thing that makes the wine taste the way it does, and figure out whether or not the wine is ready to drink. So before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And if that's the bottle that got up to 85 degrees on one summer, you give that to somebody who doesn't know the difference. <laughs> so this is a very practical thing to have around the house. In the long term, this is the norm. This kind of instrumentation for all kinds of buildings, offices especially, and industrial facilities, this will be the norm, part of the standard internet uh, environment. Okay, how about Google X, which makes Google Glass? They're the ones that do the self-driving cars. This was another ARPA experiment. Now, I cannot emphasize strongly enough for you the role that the US government, and particularly the Advanced Research Projects Agency, has had in the development of very, very high risk, very powerful technologies, which have gotten out into, or can get out into, ordinary use by the general public. In this particular case, a few years ago, the uh, ARPA, uh, DARPA team, wanted to see if it was possible to build self-driving vehicles. You can imagine all kinds of useful things that a self-driving vehicle could mean for the military, uh, especially uh, protecting personnel from not having to be out in a, in a, a vehicle that uh, might be under attack. So uh, they set out with a challenge saying there's a 127-mile very complex circuit in the desert, and we want your car to drive that circuit. The first year, all the entries ended up in the ditch in the first seven miles. The second year, seven of them made it all 127 miles. Stanford University won with the Stanford steamer. So the next year, they said, OK, let's do an urban test. And we couldn't find anybody to be pedestrians in this urban test. But we had, we had a lot of people who were willing to make entries with the self-driving cars. That year, Carnegie Mellon won. So, of course, Google hired the Stanford team and the Carnegie Mellon team. They're now at Google X. The Google X self-driving cars have driven 500,000 miles in San Francisco without human intervention and without any accidents. Now, this is driving on public streets, and there is a huge amount of computation involved. Now, for a long time, I thought the self-driving cars were completely autonomous, but I was wrong. It turns out that there is a huge amount of information available to those cars, high-resolution maps, GPS information, the uh, video imagery, and, uh, and sensors, optical sensors, uh, figuring out how far things are from, from the uh, vehicle itself. All that stuff has to be integrated, and that's done on board. But it also turns out that the cars are reporting what they're experiencing back to Google, and so the cars learn from each other, unlike uh, human motorists who don't learn from each other at all. <laughs> So, I mean, this is a silly example, but you can imagine a car driving up to an intersection it's never been at, and it knows that this thing over here is a tree because every other car that's been at that in intersection has seen the same thing, so it doesn't wait for the tree to cross the street because it knows it's a tree. Of course, if a pedestrian walks out from behind the tree, you have to know that that's a pedestrian and don't hit that. Uh, so this, this notion of the cars learning from each other and getting smarter and smarter about uh, their navigation capability is a really important notion. The hardest thing for us to do, and the one which we are still challenged to achieve, is called door-to-door. -door. Because that may mean that you have to figure out how to navigate in an underground parking garage or navigate through somebody's driveway to the appropriate back door or front door uh, of a residence. And so that is what we're challenging ourselves to do now. There are four states in the Union in the United States that have approved the use of the cars on public streets. And even if we don't get the door-to-door -door part done, you can imagine having a service system at a standard, a, a standard location in various parts of the city with access, direct access to the city streets. So you can imagine getting yourself to that location and then making use of the car to get from point to point. There are um, a number of services like that where the cars are literally shared. People use the cars to get from point A to point B. They park the cars at well-designated locations, and then other people get to use them. 
uh, in London, where I happen to live right now, the Lord Mayor of London did this with bicycles. They're called Boris bikes, and they're blue, and they're little bicycle uh, racks scattered all over London. You just take the bike and go, and then you plug it back in uh, at, when you get to the destination. It actually works. It's amazing. Sounds nuts, but uh, that's the way some things are. And besides, Boris is weird. So, uh, but he's really creative. So that's it. Now, we have a choice. I've been going on for quite a long time here. Um, here's what I would like to do. Without going into a great deal of detail on this slide, I want to pick a few things out to try to tickle your imagination. One thing I want to tell you is that for all of its difficulty in technology, the hardest things about Internet are policy related. Part of the reason for that is that engineering decisions can be made by actually doing calculations, tests, and measurements and coming up with evaluations about best choices. Policy is a matter of opinion. Sometimes it's a matter of national pride. Sometimes it's a matter of you know, other uh, individual and personal or, or ethnic or other kinds of uh, influence. That makes it much harder to deal with. There's been a tussle between the Internet community as it has evolved and the International Telecommunications Union over who should be in charge of Internet policy. And uh, you can imagine that uh, there is a group of us, including me, that would just as soon not have the ITU be responsible for that. Uh, and so there's uh, uh, some uh, controversy over that, and it continues uh, today. But I wanted to pick on the privacy and safety thing. Everybody here understands that uh, Internet has made privacy harder to achieve. And part of the reason for that is that we share an awful lot of information on the net. And this information is often, uh, you know, more information than we would normally share with the general public, but we don't notice that we've done that. Here's an example. Um, let's imagine that Gerd van der Veer has gone to Egypt and he's standing in front of the pyramids and he wants somebody to take a picture of him and let's imagine Chris, that, that he doesn't know you but he hands you his camera and he says please take a picture of me in front of the pyramids. Now by happenstance I'm nearby. Gerd doesn't know who I am and he doesn't care. I don't know. I don't even know I'm being photographed. And Garrett takes the picture from Coos and he puts it up on his website. Maybe it's Google Plus or maybe it's you know, Facebook or Flickr or something like that. Somebody else comes along and is looking for pyramids. And he finds this picture of Garrett in front of the uh, uh, Great uh, Pyramid of Cheops. And he notices that I'm in the picture. And he knows who I am, so he tags my name. Somebody else is roaming around in the net looking for pictures of me. And they discovered the picture that's been tagged, except I told them I was somewhere else on that day, and now they have a picture of me in front of the pyramid. So now I'm in trouble because of a picture that Gerd wanted somebody to take. Every one of those actions is completely innocent. We don't understand what our, the consequences are of our using these technologies. The social implications of them are still not easy for us to predict. And so I think we're going to have to live through some of the privacy questions until we come up with social conventions that make this system more comfortable for people to use. Now, I've left out the other big, you know, the elephant in the room is PRISM and the NSA uh, uh, surveillance and things like that. And here there are several reactions. One of them is people are not happy about governments looking at what they're doing when they don't think they should be able to do that. Uh, and so Google has responded to a lot of this by creating a transparency uh, report that shows what people have asked, what governments have asked for of us, how much of it, how often, and, and the like. And we post that up in our, uh, publicly on the web pages. We've been asking for permission to give more detail, not just from the American government, but from every government around the world that asks for that information of us. And we analyze every one of those requests. We evaluate whether or not they have been uh, properly authorized by court order. We push back if we think that they are excessive, but we are trying to report more and more details so people know to what degree governments are using their powers to access information on the network. We do a lot with uh, cybersecurity. We have two-factor authentication. We use cryptography to protect our users as they get to our services. The trouble is that although we have a very well-defined envelope of uh, networks that we operate, we build the hardware and the software, once everything leaves the Google environment, we don't have any control over that. So we don't know what happens when traffic gets out into the more public Internet service uh, community. So this is a big issue here. Uh, there's a related one which has to do with uh, protecting people from various kinds of 
either attack or other malware. Some things that happen on the net, by the way, are accidents. Not everything that happens on the net that's bad is necessarily somebody's deliberate uh, attempt to attack you. Sometimes it's just a mistaken configuration. And we want to be careful not to react as if everything that bad on the network was a criminal act, a national attack, or something else, especially if it isn't. So uh, I've been thinking about having a cyber fire department. And the, you know, the metaphor I have in my head is that somebody's standing in front of his house with a garden hose, the house is on fire, and thinking, I need somebody with a bigger hose and more water. And so you call the fire department. You don't call the police department. The fire department comes out, and they break in the roof, and they break in the windows, they pour water in, they put out the fire. That's their job. And so I'm imagining if you were a small, medium-sized business and you were under attack or something bad was happening, you were having a cyber fire, you wanted to call the cyber fire department and have them help you put out that cyber fire. What the fire department does after a fire is put out, they try to figure out how it started. You can imagine the same thing with a cyber fire department. If it turns out somebody did that on purpose, like arson, that's when the police department gets involved. So you shouldn't treat every bad thing that happens on the net as a crime. Although there are some things that happen on the net that are criminal in the real world, they should be criminal in the virtual world as well, like fraud and abuse and other sorts of things. In the end, these things can happen on an international basis. The bad guy in one, in one administration could harm someone else in another one. So now we have international boundaries to be concerned about. In order to deal with that, to apprehend criminals or you know, other bad actors, we're going to have to have international agreements. We have Interpol today. We can imagine having a cyber equivalent of that. I'm not going to go through the rest of the things I'd love to, but uh, you have a uh, you know, finite amount of patience, so I'm going to skip over this too. Last thing I want to talk about, and some of you, if you've been you know, watching any television shows, know that I've been talking about this too while I've been here. In 1998, the year that Google was started, some colleagues and I at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory were asking ourselves, what kind of networking should we develop that needed 25 years from then uh, in order to uh, support rich networking and communication for space exploration, both robotic and manned. <clears throat> the year before, 1997, the Pathfinder landed on Mars. This is a big balloon that dropped it and it bounced along like that and opened up and the little you know, rover drove out. I have to remember thinking if somebody had come into my office to tell me that's how they were going to deliver this expensive payload, I would have thrown them out of the office. But it actually worked. So we were, we were thinking about the missions that were subsequently planned to go to Mars, thinking, okay, what kind of networking could we supply to them? Because up until that time, the only way we could talk to these spacecraft was a point-to-point -point radio link. And here we have, you know, in 1998, a substantial number of years of experience with a very rich networking environment called Internet. So we started out thinking, well, uh, we, we can use TCP on Mars, right? It works on Earth, so it ought to work on Mars. And the answer is yes, it would work on Mars. Then we started thinking about, well, what would happen if we were trying to use those protocols to talk between Earth and Mars? This gets a little more complicated. For one thing, it's not a fixed distance. We're in orbit, and the distance varies depending on where we are in our orbits. When we're closest together, we're 35 million miles apart. When we're farthest apart, we're 235 million miles apart. And of course, with the outer planets, the numbers get even bigger. It turns out the speed of light is too slow. When you try to transmit information from Earth to Mars when we're closest together, it takes three and a half minutes one way for a radio signal to go at the speed of light, and it takes another three and a half minutes for a response to come back. And when we're farthest apart in our orbits, it's 40 minutes round trip time. The TCP protocol was not designed to deal with a 40 minute round trip time. Uh, its flow control mechanism was very simple. You basically told the other guy, I've run out of room, stop transmitting. And if you can say that, and he hears it within a few hundred milliseconds, it works. You know, there's a little bit of buffering. However, what if he doesn't hear you for 20 minutes and he's pumping traffic at you at full speed and the packets are coming and falling all over everywhere? Uh, flow control doesn't work with that kind of round-trip time delay and it just gets worse to the outer planets. And there's one other problem. It's called uh, planetary rotation. We haven't figured out how to stop that. <laughs> uh, so, so if you've got something on the surface of Mars and you're communicating with a point-to-point -point link, when Mars rotates, you can't talk to it anymore because it's on the wrong side of the planet. So we have a variably delayed and disruptive communication system, very different from terrestrial communication. Now we say, okay, fine, we have to go design a whole new suite of protocols, which we, in fact, were forced into doing. When the 2004 rovers landed in January, the plan at the time was to transmit data from the surface of Earth 
to the deep space network on uh, the surface of Mars to the deep space network on Earth. They turned on the radios and they overheated. So they were only designed to transmit at 28 kilobits a second, and the scientists were unhappy about that number to begin with. And we said to them, you're going to have to reduce the duty cycle on that radio because we don't want it to overheat and ruin all the other equipment. And they're even more grumpy about that. Then somebody at JPL said, well, we have an X-band radio on the rover, and it can't get all the way back to Earth, but it could get up to the orbiters, which had been put there to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rover should go in the first place. But they'd finished that job. They were still in operation. They, were, you know, they had operating computers, communications, and power. And we had this programmable machine on the surface. So somebody said, why don't we reprogram the computers on the rover and the computers on the orbiters so that the rover would wait for a satellite to come overhead, transmit the data up to the satellite, have it hold on to the data until it gets to the right place in the orbit and transmit the data back to Earth. Now, because we were close in orbit, we could actually go to 128 kilobits a second. And because this spacecraft was out of the atmosphere and had bigger uh, solar panels, it could transmit back to Earth at 128 kilobits a second. So this is store and forward. That's packet switching. That's how the internet works. So we built a packet switched store and forward network. 99.999% of all the data that's coming back from Mars is going store and forward. So we demonstrated with the rovers that a small store and forward packet switch net was a big help. When the Phoenix lander arrived in May of 2008, it was at the North Pole. And it turns out there was no configuration that could go directly back to Earth, so we used the same store and forward technique. When the Mars Science Lander arrived last year, in August, I guess, the same thing is true. We use store and forward to get all the data back. So we are really doing networking. This thing is operational now. So we've added those protocols to the International Space Station. We've also put it on board a spacecraft called Epoxy, which is in orbit around the sun. It was originally called Deep Impact. It went to a, uh, a comet, and it sent a probe into the comet, blew out the center so they could analyze what the interior looked like. And it rendezvoused with Hartley II a few years later. So we have the interplanetary protocols on board all those vehicles. Now we're standardizing them with the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems. Once all of those standardizations are done, what we hope will happen is that everybody who launches spacecraft for scientific purposes, manned or robotic, will use these standard protocols, which will make all of them interoperable. And when each of these spacecraft has completed the scientific mission, we can repurpose it to become a node of an interplanetary backbone, which will expand over time as missions are launched. So by the end of the century, we may have a fairly robust interplanetary network to support manned and robotic exploration. That's not the end of the story. This is the last slide. Back to ARPA. Last year, ARPA gave a half million dollar contract to a consortium to study the design of a spacecraft to get to the nearest star in 100 years. Now, there are three problems associated with this. Problem number one, propulsion. The current propulsion systems that are available would take 65,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri, 4.4 light years away. That's a little long even for an ARPA experiment. Uh, it's six times longer than our civilization has been on the planet. So the first thing we need to do is to get better propulsion capability. And right now, the candidate is an ion engine with substantial thrust and enough mass to continue operation for 100 years. When we get to the 50-year halfway mark, you flip the spacecraft over and you uh, decelerate as you come into the Alpha Centauri system. Because otherwise, you go zipping through Alpha Centauri at 20% the speed of light, and you get one picture, and that's it. <laughs> so, So... That's an expensive photograph. So the idea is to uh, put the spacecraft in orbit at the destination. Now, um, navigation is another problem. In interplanetary navigation, you typically send mid-course correction uh, information to the spacecraft as it's part of the way uh, to destination. So when we go from Earth to Mars, for example, uh, there is a mid-course correction, possibly more than one. And this takes uh, a few minutes of round trip time to uh, confirm a burn and to verify the, uh, the new orbit parameters. Um, now, imagine you have a spacecraft that's a uh, light year away on its way to uh, Alpha Centauri. It takes a year to send the mid-course correction signal, and it takes a year to find out what happened. 
because the speed of light is not getting any faster. That's not exactly interactive. So the solution for um, this particular case is to do autonomous navigation. What you do, we know something about the uh, proper motion of the stars that are within about 10 light years of Earth. And so we use that information plus stars that are much farther away to orient the spacecraft and do autonomous navigation. So that problem's okay. The part that I'm concerned about is communication. How do I generate a signal from four light years away that I can actually detect? And now you know why I want the interplanetary backbone. I need to build a synthetic aperture receiver the size of the solar system in order to detect the femtosecond laser signal coming back because the laser, despite its narrow collimation, will have spread to the size of the solar system by, it goes, by the time it goes four light years away. So I need to assemble all the uh, energy that's detectable and put it back together again in order to correctly interpret the signal coming from Alpha Centauri. One of our physicists, though, pointed out that, um, that gravity bends light. We know this because that's how we demonstrated Einstein's uh, theory of relativity by watching starlight shift uh, as we looked at an eclipse of the sun. We could see the star that was normally over here appear to be there because the light had been bent by the sun's gravity. It turns out that there is a focal length on the sun's gravity, a lens, acting as a lens. There's a, there's a focal plane, which is about 550 astronomical units away. I'll do the math. It's about 55 billion miles away from the sun. Now, the only spacecraft we have that's gone even near that far is the Voyager. It's about 13 billion miles away. So we have some work to do to get something 55 billion miles away from the sun at the focal plane of its gravity, but that would be a great test for uh, the ion engine that we are anticipating might be used to get to Alpha Centauri. So the idea is to go out 550 AU away at the focal length and then use that to collimate and re reassemble the light coming from Alpha Centauri. So that's the current up-to-the-date status of the interstellar program and the interplanetary program. I'm happy to answer questions if people have the patience for that, and in any case, Thank you very much for coming together tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sir. That was absolutely fantastic. Nice to enjoy. Would you be prepared to take a few questions? I'm happy to take a few questions. I need to warn you, I'm hearing impaired, and I don't want to be the guy that came to talk and didn't listen, so I may need some help to hear the questions. You might need to repeat them for me. Right, we'll do that. I'll get some assistance to help me uh, repeat the questions as well. It's a little complicated. Right, we'll take some questions. Anybody would like to stop? We, we don't have any. Uh, there's a hand up over there. We don't. Do we have a roving microphone or not? Um, if we uh, don't, yes, there it is. Okay, we do have one. I'll tell you what, I'm going to drive the camera guys crazy. I can go up there and hold the microphone. No, okay. Let's. Okay, go ahead. Let's try. But can you hear me okay? Well, I, yes, but I don't necessarily am going to be able to understand the words. It, volume isn't the issue. I mean, it's, literally, it's acuity. I'm 65 dB down, so. Okay. Go ahead. Let's ask the question. Let's see what happens. But I'd like to ask you to elaborate a little more on what you said about the, the, the tough problem of policy Sort of versus right. internet engineering. Um, there's the famous John Gilmore comment that the, the net interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. Is that hopelessly naive today in, in what we know now about state surveillance? Um, is that an, an unsolvable problem or is that something where you see kind of active development tackling the problem? Uh, this specifically with regard to policy and, uh, and standardization and governance? Yeah, 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 for sure, uh, and in the way that, that average okay. users engage with the internet. So, so I, I want you to appreciate that the internet arose from an extremely cooperative environment. It's the academic world that we live in. We don't buy information from each other. We barter information. We share information. That's how science advances. And so the internet world grew up in that uh, context. So almost all of the policy making that has gone on for internet up until now has been multi-stakeholder, where the people who are affected by the policy get to participate in that. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers was designed around a multi-stakeholder model of policy making. The regional internet registries similarly are organized that way for IP address allocation. Uh, so there has been a, um, a kind of debate over whether we should persist in this multi-stakeholder world or whether we should accept the kind of top-down government is in charge of, of everything 
Uh, the rest of the stakeholders are free to express their opinions, but governments make the final decision. And that's part of the tension. The ITU is a, a long-standing organization, been around since the mid-1800s, uh, and is an, a, a national membership organization. And while it's possible for the private sector to participate, it doesn't have a vote. Uh, in the uh, ICANN world, uh, all of that process uh, involves all of the multiple stakeholders. So uh, for my money, I want to preserve that multi-stakeholder bottom-up policy-making activity. At the same time, governments have to be a part of that process because there are some things that only governments can do, whether it's a national uh, decision or an international one. Uh, I kind of favor a word called transnational because in a funny sense, that's what internet is. It's, it doesn't recognize international boundaries. And packets just go slipping right by. They have no idea that they've crossed over any international boundary. And I thought that was cool. Uh, but the point now is that we have to have a collaborative way of developing policy for internet use. And so I hope that's the way it comes out. But the tension is still there. Uh, there are, because there are abuses that occur on the network, and you know, we freely admit that's true, and we shouldn't ignore them, Governments are created in order to protect their citizens. There are a few examples where that isn't true. Syria is probably a good example of that right now. But most governments are there to protect the citizens from harm and to create a, uh, a rule of law. What I uh, hope we can do is to make governments a part of this process of policy development, which is true in the case of ICANN, uh, and have all of those stakeholders help develop policy, including what happens on an international basis where we have to do law enforcement uh, in a cooperative way, collaborative way. So that's the current state of affairs is fairly fluid. But if we're lucky, we'll retain the kind of permissionless innovation that has driven the internet up until now, where people didn't have to get permission from every ISP in the world before they could operate or offer a new application. That's where I hope it will come out, but it's going to take some work to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, one more over there, uh, Chris. This is like a hot dog going across a, a, one of those um, baseball games, and you hope you get the hot dog at the end, right? OK, yes, sir. You, you talked a bit about uh, security on the internet yeah. being very important, uh, leading to a public key cryptography yes. and the importance of that. Uh, but it was reported uh, recently uh, through these leaks from Snowden that uh, public key cryptography has effectively been rendered uh, pretty much useless, either through cracking these codes by, by the US government uh, or, or, or bypassing public key cryptography, uh, you know, uh, rather than cracking the codes themselves. But uh, is the state of public key cryptography really over now uh, that new techniques have to be uh, developed uh, to, to uh, secure the important uh, security of the internet which you referred to for business, for uh, for all kinds of, uh, of human endeavor. Uh, privacy seems to be quite okay. important. Thank you. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. The short answer is no. Public key cryptography is still relevant. But the key sizes may have to get a lot bigger. You understand that as you increase the key size, you get an exponential work factor. And what I think what may have happened, depending on you know how uh, you interpret the reports that some of us have seen in the news, uh, some organizations that have enough computing power may have cracked the 10, you know, the 1,024-bit keys, in which case that's a problem. But the solution to that problem is to extend the work factor enough that it is not possible to so solve the uh, uh, the problems that are uh, that involve the use of factoring of large numbers as the work factor mechanism. Now, factoring large numbers. Uh, is a very powerful tool until you get to quantum computing. And as soon as you get to quantum computing, factoring large numbers becomes much easier. The work factor goes down because of the simultaneity of the computation. There are people who are worried about that, and they're looking at alternatives to using um, the factoring as the work factor mechanism. So we are going to have to deal with that. There's, there's no question that research in non-factoring uh, 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 for work factor uh, has to be solved, and that's a, an important research area, and some people here who may be interested in that uh, should be pursuing it. In the meantime, there are some other issues associated with um, public key crypto that make it um, not not acceptable in the current form. 
Some of you may have heard of things called certificate authorities. What these things do uh, is digitally sign a certificate which says, to, to give you just a concrete example, this domain name is associated with this um, public key. And <clears throat> when you, I'm sorry, let me say this more carefully. This domain name and this IP address are bound to each other. And this certificate is stating that. And then this is digitally signed. The digital signature in this case is intended to make it possible for you to verify that the combination hasn't been altered. This is by doing a cryptographic hash of, this, of the uh, pair, the uh, domain name and the IP address, and then uh, encrypting that using a public key one-way uh, encryption mechanism. The problem is that the certificate authorities can affirm the binding of any string that it wants to. And so without going into gory detail, some certificate authorities have been broken into surreptitiously and false certificates have been generated and digitally signed. So for example, if you had a digital certificate that said, this is Microsoft and, and this is my public key, uh, and this is digitally signed, so anything you receive from something that says it's from Microsoft, you should accept because the key is checks correctly, except that the certificate authority falsely signed that thing. The problem is the certificate authorities can sign any string they want to. We didn't constrain what they were allowed to do. There is a new design which doesn't rely on a centralized or even a, a multiple certificate authorities. Instead, it uses the domain name system in order to put that information inside the DNS. Now, I'm, I'm way down in the weeds here, and I apologize for that. The, the net you should take away is that there are ways of using public key cryptography that are more powerful and more resistant to uh, attack than the present ways of using it. So the basic idea is still very good. The only issue is how it gets applied. And we're seeing very active efforts right now to apply it in different ways to provide much more security than we have today. Uh, the two-factor authentication is also another example. We're really bad at picking passwords. We pick passwords that other people can guess because we can remember them. Some people use password as the password, you know, because it's easy to remember. The trouble is other people know that and they use it. You know. So uh, two-factor authentication basically involves having a device in addition to, to knowing something, a PIN or, or another password. Uh, when I moved to the UK, I got an account at Barclays Bank. And much to my surprise, a after my account was set up, I got a little device in the mail and a card that had a, a chip in it. And in order to perform transactions in the online Barclays system, I had to stick my card into this little device, put in my PIN, and it generated a cryptographically produced password, which was different each time. That's two factors, the little device, my card, and my PIN that I remembered. All of their transactions involve using this sort of digital signature mechanism. It's very impressive, actually. I even called up Bank of America and said, why aren't you doing this? And you know, there was some noise on the other end of the line. Uh, I, maybe they will do something. I don't know. So there are ways to deal with the problem. Your point is extremely well taken, though. We have to step back and ask ourselves, how are we using cryptography? Uh, and can, how do we use it better? And there are ways to do that, and that's happening now. Okay, I think we have time at most thank, for one more question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm under very strict instructions to allow 15 minutes. Uh, that was 12 minutes. So I'm allowed one more. Can you handle okay. one more question? Okay, fair enough. There's a hand over here. Yeah. I'm going to make a decision. And the, and the microphone is convenient. But... This one. Hi, can you hear me? Good evening. Yeah, remember, uh, you're being recorded, so uh, yes. be thoughtful about it. I must it. be nervous. Just, just you know. Okay, my, my, my question actually is about the content on the internet, so it's a slight deviation. Yes. You know, at the moment what the internet has done is it's made content and information, you know, available to anyone, such so obviously helps with that, but, it, you know, everything is now online. And generally speaking, the large percentage of that is free, except for organizations. So the information put in by individuals and a lot of the information put in by companies is free for use. Now, I, I just want to know what you see in terms of the future of that, because the one problem I see with that personally is that when you put information on the internet, you are putting value onto the internet. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily 
as an individual or a small organization get any benefit for that value. Do you think that something will come about in the internet which will um, improve the value derived or the benefit derived uh, based on the value? Okay, this is a very, very good question. Uh, let me try to respond three different ways. First of all, the internet is a really big tent and it will support virtually any kind of information sharing, including information sharing that requires you to make a payment or otherwise show that you have legitimate access to the data. Now, it's absolutely true that once things are digitized, it's not very hard to replicate them and distribute them. And that's one of the reasons that the intellectual property community has been very nervous about digital technology and the internet. In particular, if you think for just a moment about the World Wide Web, which is not the same as internet, it's an application that sits on top. Uh, but I want you to remember how browsers work. The way browsers work is that the program that runs the browser figures out which website it wants to go to. Maybe you type www.google.com. And that program goes out on the net using the internet protocols and it copies a file. It copies the home page of the destination website. Copies the file. It then interprets the file and renders it. So the web is a giant copying engine. If you're an intellectual property company trying to keep people from copying stuff unless they pay you, this sounds a little scary. However, it's absolutely reasonable to deliver things to people that are encrypted and, and sell them the key to unlock it. Now you would say, well, somebody would buy a copy of the, whatever it is, the book, the music or something, and then put the key up on the net. Well, first of all, it's not gonna, if nobody can find the key, no harm is done. If everybody can find the key, then so can the, or the party who has just been harmed by that act. And we have to consider that is a violation of intellectual property protection. So we clearly have to have a regime in which those sorts of events are detected and uh, we tell people there will be consequences. And so Google has gone to a great deal of trouble, for example, to fingerprint video and audio in order to protect it in the YouTube context. We get 100 hours of video and audio uploaded into YouTube per minute. 100 hours of video per minute. We don't have the staff to go look at all that. And so we have programs that do it. And I know they work because I had the following thing happen to me. Uh, when uh, my colleagues and I were honored by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, the day after that, we went to a place to meet with about 250 young students to hear what their aspirations were and to talk to them. And this was videotaped. There was a, a lecture, short lecture given by uh, one of the participants on um, physics, and he used a clip from the Olympics last year showing some people on bicycles and they were in an angle and he was trying to explain the physics of all that. It was about a two and a half minute clip. So after the event was over, I was given a videotape and asked, could you put this up on YouTube so everybody could get access to it? And I thought, well, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So I put it up. Two minutes after I put it up, I got an email from Google saying the International Olympics Committee objects to your use of that video because it has a clip in it that is uh, protected. And I'm thinking, two and a half minutes, that's unbelievable. Uh, so then, of course, I was all pissed off because I, you know, this was a, a piece of, uh, uh, the video was being used in a pedagogical context. So uh, they said, do you want to dispute this? And I said, yes, and I typed in all my information that sent back. They put the video back up during the dispute. And then I thought, well, we really ought to get this over with quickly. And I'm in a privileged position at Google, so I called the YouTube guys and they said, can we please, <laughs> please accelerate this process? I wasn't trying to get around it. I just wanted to accelerate the process. And so the uh, Olympic Committee attention was drawn to this thing. They agreed this was a pedagogical use and the next day they agreed they would allow it to stay up. But the point I want to make is it's possible to do this kind of detection in near real time and that's important. I think in the long run we're going to see a very broad range of choices uh, expressed. It's incredible how much information gets up on the net because people just wanted to share what they knew and, and they take away a great satisfaction that something they knew was useful to somebody else. And I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's really powerful. Um, you know what MIT did? They put up all their coursework on the net. And people said, you're crazy. And they said, no, we're not. People get to see the quality of the stuff we do at MIT. If they already understand it, they don't have to come to MIT. If they don't understand it, the only way they're going to learn is to come to MIT. So, you know, that was reasonable. How about MOOCs, these, you know, Massive online open courses, these 
uh, our, my two colleagues at Google decided they were going to teach a class on the net on artificial intelligence. And they thought 500 people might sign up. 160,000 people signed up for the course. And of course, there was a momentary, holy crap, what do we do now? And the immediate you know, reprogramming of everything to handle scale. Uh, since that time, classes as large as 350,000 people have appeared on the net. Now, the, the way in which this stuff gets worked is really interesting because it inverts the classroom experience. The lecturers at Stanford, who are very excited about this, record their lectures, tell the students, watch these as many times as you want. When, you're, you know, when you come into the class, let's solve problems. So you now have an idea of why that stuff was important to learn. So I talked to John Hennessy, the president of Stanford, thinking he was going to be happy about this because he charges $50,000 a year for tuition. Why would he want you know, this MOOC thing uh, you know, at lower prices than $50,000 a year? And he said, you didn't do the math, did you? And I said, what do you mean? He says, what if you had a class of 100,000 people and you paid 10 rand per person? Let's see. Let's do the math. 10 rand times 100,000 is a million rand class. How many professors do you know have taught a million rand class? You know, that's enough money so you could pay the TAs to help the students. Uh, in fact, this opens up the market dramatically for people who are at work who can't go back to school on a permanent basis but could take classes whenever it's convenient for them. And so we have continuing education possibilities. To say nothing of the physical increase of the absolute class size, you'd have to be crazy not to want to go down this path and figure out how to make things work. Now, one last point, and I'll shut up. There were some, there were some academics who looked at the 160,000 person class, and only 23,000 people actually finished the course. And they said, oh, this is awful. I mean, look how few people managed to pass the class. And I wanted to go grab them and say, excuse me, how many people have you taught artificial intelligence over the last 40 years? You're, you're lucky if you taught 2,000 people. This one class taught 23,000 people. So this is a huge opportunity. And this is one of the reasons why I think you should be interested in this, because the best teachers are the ones who are going to become the superstars of education because they can reach such a huge audience through the internet. That's why we need high bandwidth uh, internet here in South Africa so people can take advantage of that. Thank you very much. Dr. Sir, Dr. done. You've been very generous indeed with your time and it's much appreciated. I want to ask Dr. Angus Hay to come and thank you for the presentation. I'll stand in front. Oh, you want me to come around the other way? I don't like. Mike, do you want to talk about the power? No, that's fine. Right. Um, it falls to me to um, thank Vint Cerf, the, the father of the internet, for having graced us with his presence tonight to present the 67th Bernard Price Memorial Lecture. Um, a number of things struck me about the presentation. I think the, the first one is somewhat of a philosophical question or philosophical issue that I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer is. Uh, Vint mentioned that when they first came up with the internet, there wasn't a Google to ask. And it just struck me, if you were into inventing the internet today, would you ask Google? <laughs> That's interesting. And maybe just to mention that uh, we also want to thank Google for having helped us set up the Google Hangout, which is still going out live and uh, which everybody can go and look at afterwards on YouTube. Um, something else which was somewhat of a phenomenon, which I'm sure if we go back a couple of years would not have happened, but this Bernard Price lecture is really truly a phenomenon on Twitter as well. So if you just if you've been watching what's happened on Twitter, there's a whole lot of stuff happening out there on Twitter about this lecture as well, which I'm going to mention shortly. Um, the internet was, uh, in Vince's words, an experiment in the early 70s that escaped. Um, I think it's been a somewhat successful experiment. It's difficult to think of any other experiment in the world that has crossed every conceivable national boundary and that today touches 3 billion people. That's not bad for 40 years. Remarkably, as Vince had mentioned, the internet is still, still evolving. We are moving, hopefully, from IPv4 to IPv6. 
Um, somebody, uh, my wife mentioned to me that uh, I should ask you this question, what happened to IPv5? It was an experiment that didn't work out and we just ignored it and went on to IPv6. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it's true. We were doing, it was a streaming video and audio thing and it didn't scale. And so we said, okay, what's the next number? And we go on to the next experiment. And, and, and on that note, uh, just to repeat, you have to go to your ISP and ask, what is your plan for IPv6 implementation and when do I get my address space? Um, talking a little bit about the Internet of Things, um, and I think uh, we, we learned one very important thing about the, the Internet of Things, and that is not to put your bathroom scale in your fridge on the same network. <laughs> but to be a bit more serious, the, it's an interesting point that uh, cars that do not have drivers are better at learning from each other than human drivers. That's also somewhat philosophical, I think. Um, with regard to security and privacy on the internet, um, I, I think we've, we've had a few insights here and, and also um, understood from, uh, from Vint that you know, all of us have, have to live with the fact that, we, that these privacy issues are not going to go away and we're going to have to find a way to deal with them. Um, and particularly that not everything bad that happens on the internet is criminal. We, we need a fire brigade. That, uh, that I think is, a, is, a, is an interesting thought as, to, as opposed to a police force, a fire brigade for the internet. Um, we've learned a little bit about the interplanetary internet um, and although we not going to stop planetary rotation very soon, we do know that it's possible to get interoperable spacecraft. Um, and I think that's certainly looking to the future. That's where we want to be. Just to bring that a little bit closer to home, um, I Vint had mentioned that he likes South Africa. I would love it for you to come back to us more often. Uh, we know that he likes South African wine because that came up very early in the conversation when we were inviting him. Um, and uh, but we also know that in South Africa, the internet is not where it should be. Uh, one of the things that has happened in South Africa over the last few years is that we've slipped behind many other countries um, on the continent. We need to change that. And we need to address the infrastructure challenges and we need to address the regulatory challenges that are stopping that from uh, us from, from taking uh, our rightful place back at, uh, as, the, as the leaders of the internet in the South African continent. Um, Questions like the sharing of spectrum, using technology instead of regulation to achieve uh, the goals that we're looking to achieve. Um, the internet will share anything. And as Winter pointed out, the, the internet grew up in a very cooperative environment. And there's been a lot of regulation. There's been a lot of talk of regulation. There's been a lot of uh, top-down governance that's been tried to be applied to the internet. But uh, at, it, at its heart, the internet is a cooperative environment. Um, I said I would come back to the question of Twitter. Now, un unfortunately, not everything that goes out on Twitter is terribly serious. Um, and I was looking for a tweet that really embodied uh, th this talk, and I couldn't find one. Uh, but I did find one year, very interesting tweet. Um, we'll have to see who said it. Uh, which was that, uh, stated that Vint Cerf is the architect from the Matrix. <laughs> 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 I have okay. I, I have a response to this. Actually, this has come up uh, more than once. I've been at some <laughs> lectures. I've been at some lectures where somebody put up a picture on the screen of you know the architect and me and saying you know is there implying something. And my response to this is very simple. What makes you think you're not in the matrix? <laughs> <laughs> So in, in closing then, and um, thank you Vint for, for, for having been here, and thank you for having squeezed us into your schedule. We have been trying for some time to, to get Vint to come out to South Africa, and unfortunately Google's plans coincided with ours, and, and thank you very much for having been here. I'm going to just make one more statement, which I think got the, the loudest applause from the audience and repeat it, and that is that we need high bandwidth internet in South Africa. Yes. Yes, we do. And uh, a, a small gift from the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. Um, it, by its shape, I think you can tell that it is a terribly old-fashioned way of, uh, of, of printing material. Um, but uh, this is a, a gift from the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. In, I gift. appreciate it. I'm a bibliophile, so <laughs> thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Sip. It was most enjoyed and everybody was much appreciated. Um,
remains for me to thank the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Adam Habib, and Wits University for letting us use the facilities. It's been a tradition for at least 62 years that we've had this close cooperation between the Institute of Electrical Engineers and Wits. It's been working very well. We hope it's going to continue for the next 62 years. Uh, I, I said earlier on, I'm the president of the Institute of Electrical Engineers. I'm the 105th president of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. And uh, we really appreciate very much to, to have this. The other thing I would like to thank Dr. Angus Hay for arranging this. We've been trying for a long time, as Angus said, to get you to, to, to do this talk. And uh, it's taken some organizing on his part to do that. And uh, I really appreciate it very much. And uh, I, I, think that, I think the whole house has gone very, very well. So thank you indeed for, for being here. And thank you, Professor Habib, for giving us the facilities. Uh, remains for me to invite the audience to participate in uh, uh, some refreshment in the foyer outside here that has been set up by SAIE. Thank you very much for your attendance. And thank you. Very much. Thank you.